Welcome to Faith, Reason, and Geekdom. I'm your genuflexer, Roger. My brothers and sisters in Christ, every other Wednesday, we work out these three perspectives in our culture. That's what I call Christian genuflexing. Thank you guys for joining me today. Today we got a very special guest, my brother, uh, Axe Brother, fellow Axe Brother, fellow uh, Sheen Goer. I guess you get the Sheen Goer. That, that, that sounds like a some type of hair product that you put in your hair. Uh, yeah, man, John Murphy, he is here with me today. Glad we've been talking about coming on the podcast, and finally we we're able uh, to make it happen. So we're going to be getting into a few two little things. Once we're recording Wednesday, December the eighth. And it is the Immaculate Conception. So we're going to get into a little bit about that, about uh, the Blessed Mary. Also, we're going to get into a little bit about some books you've been reading, uh, Mrs. in the book. So why don't you do a little brief introduction? Well, uh, hello. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you for having me on here, Roger. Um, there's an uh, endless amount of things that we could talk about. Uh, but we'll see where we get, you know, mysticism is a, is a subject that I'm almost afraid to talk about some because it's so unique to the individual, uh, too much talking about it could be not such a good thing, but, um, you know, the feast of the uh, immaculate conception, probably a point of interest for anyone that's interested in the, in Christmas and, and, you know, the, the, the time of. Uh, Christ, you know, the, the biblical times leading up to that moment in Mary's life and contemplation on Mary's life. Uh, so, yeah, there's quite a bit to talk about. Preparing. You know, as, as you were talking about earlier before you, you we got on, you are talking about, like, you got this Christmas decorations and all that. We have the, the little little scene, little angels, activities, and getting ready for the, the Adventus Christus, which is the coming, the coming of our Lord. Um, Advent, that's what it's, it's the coming, you know, so... Getting in the spirit, and then especially since the Immaculate Conception, uh, and this goes back again when we talk about this could be a whole other subject, but real quick when we talk about this, this was in 1854. Pope Pius he does the official the the dogma that was officially, but just because it was in 1854, that doesn't mean um, hundreds of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before that so just because again some people might point to that be like oh that's something you know in the 19th century it's like no uh the church fathers church history church tradition all of that points to already a wide uh, held belief in the church east and west of uh, the immaculate conception so and then too the famous you know a lot of people get the immaculate uh, conception wrong is they they think that's when uh, if you the see, incarnation exactly yeah, the yeah. incarnation of Jesus Christ the hypostatic union fully man fully God yeah so that's where they get the what is it the, also the the immaculate reception mm-hmm, <laughs> you ever yeah. heard of that was that Roger Starback or who right. was that yeah in, in the old football so you hear that but yeah that's a misconception I hear a lot of people like oh the immaculate conception is when Jesus uh, but no it's actually not uh, but it's good to just uh, speak on Mary and um, I I kind of want to say too. Um, what is your, uh, devotion to Mary during the, the Adventus Christus? Like what is, what is your Mary devotions, prayers, uh, different devotions or what, whatever you have fit into that during this time of, of Advent, the coming? Well, my devotions, my Marian devotion is, is really just, it's a, it's a daily thing. You know, it doesn't really change too much. I think it hasn't, at least in the Advent season, uh, Making sure that I say, you know, rosary. I try to say one at least once a day. Wearing my brown scapular, meditating on her life, meditating on her role, you know, in salvation. And, uh, you know, saying yes to God, you know, being open to his graces, um, you know, and rising to the occasion so that she could be, uh, you know, the new ark and carry the incarnate word in her womb. You know, so that in and of itself is a magnificent feat, you know, and aside from Christ's work, uh, that work leading up to that is probably the most profound work in all of humanity and all of human history is, is Mary's uh, devotion to God 
leading up to that. Of course, we don't know a lot about her life. So just meditating on that. Uh, and that's why the rosary is so important. It's really important to learn the scriptures behind the rosary mysteries. Um, and that will, will help you sort of understand Mary a little bit more. And then when you understand Mary, what, what does that do? It, it really just draws you closer to Christ. You know, a devotion to Mary is a devotion to Christ. Um, and so for me, it doesn't really change very much during the Advent season. Uh, you know, on days like today, I'm, you know, I'll pray the glorious mysteries in honor of Mary, but it's Wednesday, so I would normally play the, pray the glorious mysteries anyway. Um, and, you know, just thinking and reflecting on that, uh, the gospel of Luke is, you know, a great Marian gospel. So, uh, you know, I, st- I think some folks are doing like a, a chapter, uh, a chapter a day in the month of December, you know, uh, from the book of Luke. So anybody out there that wants to, you know, grow closer to Mary, I'd say start with the Gospels. If you want to grow closer with Mary, then just start with the Gospel of Luke, you know. Uh, pray the the uh, Magnificat, you know. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's actually very, and also too, I was going to say too, uh, we got another special guest here. Uh, my my two year old Ezekiel is is joining us as well too, ba- babysitting, do daddy daycare, taking care of. So uh, if you guys bear with me in the background, he's pretty quiet. He's 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 a little quiet boy, Ezekiel. But uh, if you hear noises in the background, that that that's what it is. It, it'd be my son Ezekiel. Uh, but he's he's very uh, well behaved and, and pretty quiet, you know, and uh, if you don't, you don't like, uh, that means uh, you hate children. So how, how dare you, how dare all of you. <laughs> so some of, some of the things again, in this, in this, this advent, the arrival or coming of this, that we, we should think about uh, Adventus Christus is what can we do to get closer to Jesus? She always leads us to her son. So the devotions that we have to her, uh, the proto gelium of James, I, I would suggest to read to that again, like you alluded to earlier, you were saying uh, you want to learn to get closer to Mary. You want to do like read the gospels. And I would, I would say, amen. Like I would agree with that. The 100% is yeah. Read the gospels. Uh, but also check out um, the proto gelium of James. Um, it's not canonical scripture. Of course, you know, it's not, you know, it's canon of the scripture or anything like that but i definitely think there's there's a lot of good information in there about the 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 younger life and so i would point to that uh the rosary i need to get better i've been consistently doing it every week like clockwork for over over a year or so but i don't do it every day and i think that's something i should grow on during we think about this christmas season we're in the christmas season and uh our lord and savior jesus christ is coming through mary's fiat her yes Mary is the the new Ark of the Covenant. Also, we would say in typology, uh, she is the new Eve. And I think a lot, even Protestant scholars would agree to that. So the first Eve, she said a no, you know, and the new Eve, Mary, she said yes. And she's carrying Jesus, the baby Jesus, fully human and fully divine, the Theotokos, the mother of God. And if you say, well, she's not the mother of God, like, how do you not see that? Like, it's impossible. You can't separate. You can't separate the two. So I would say is, uh, once again, uh, Mary is always through Mary to Jesus because that's what she wills is God's will. That's her will. And we don't worship her. And again, there are, yes, yes, I've came across people that where it seems like they're worshiping Mary. But the church would condemn that. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, was it 2112, it condemns any worship of any other deity other than the living God. And that's in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So whenever somebody says, because, you know, we were talking about Mary, you know, it's Christmas time. So I think it's good to talk about Mary because she's the one that gave birth to our Lord and Savior. So it's a, it's a good topic to kind of, but we do get uh, accused of a Mary worship. Point them to the official, the official church teachings, and not what a small minority group may may or may not be doing. That you don't judge it by the followers who don't follow the official teachings. You judge it by the actual official teachings. 
And uh, of course, we call it a, a, a latria, it's the adoration, worship only to God. And then hyperdulia or dulia for Blessed Virgin Mary and the other saints asking for intercessions. So, yeah, right there in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, you guys could look it up. Um, it says it w without a doubt, we don't worship or we're not to worship Mary, but we give her high honor because, again, she is the mother of God, the Theotokos, and she gave birth to Jesus. Uh, so those are some of the devotions or meditations I would meditate on, just thinking about that, just thinking about her yes, thinking about the Gabriel. Uh, like you were talking about the, the rosaries and, and the, uh, the mysteries, um, meditating on that mystery. And, and what I like to do is I would, while well, I'm doing the rosary, and when I come upon it, when the, the angel Gabriel uh, comes to Mary and what I, th I imagine myself being there and I imagine like it's dark, it's in, it's in the desert somewhere, you know, in the, in the area and it's dark. And I, I imagine myself like first person view, like I'm walking up to the little house or home, wherever they're in, like a little wooden home, like, you know, some type of something they would have in those times. And I imagine like colors just coming out of the, the little wood cabin. And I imagine like blue and pink and white, just, just all these crazy colors. And I imagine myself opening the door and seeing the Virgin uh, Mary sitting on the bed and the angel Gabriel just like, you can't really see him. Like in my mind, I can make out him of uh, the traditional, you know, wings and all that sword, but like just full of color, just full of like, uh, just, just these, these beautiful blues and reds and, and, and white colors, gold, like all these. And it's almost like, I can't look. And I just imagine he's floating above the bed. Like, you know, I'm like right now I'm picturing it right now. And that's what I, when, when I do the rosary, as I'm saying the decade, I, that's what I'm picturing is as a first person view of that. Uh, so if you could give us some of your, the devotions, I know you were talking about, you do a little prayer consecration in the, um, yeah, well, the, the, the morning offering prayer, yes, you. you know, it, it opens up with, you know, Jesus through the immaculate heart of Mary and I offer you all my prayers, works, joys, and sufferings of this day. You're basically just, you know, saying Christ, you came to us through the womb of your mother Mary and then you know we ask that through her intercession you know we, we're going to offer you what we're going to do today you know and that's that's kind of a good way to start off the day um you know with with regard to uh Mary you know in her in her role uh you know when i think about it uh historically you know in a normal kingdom you would have let's say a a king that is an heir and he becomes the king of the nation maybe after his father the king passes away or something like that. But then at that point in time, his mother uh, becomes the queen regent, you know, so the, the sort of the queen by default. And that's sort of where Mary is. And when, when Catholics refer to her as the queen of heaven or as the queen of the angels, uh, it's just logical, you know. She's well, yeah. By default, she's queen because she's the mother of the heir of the throne. She's the mother of the Lord. So, uh, any good subject in any good kingdom would know. Oh, you show utter respect, uh, the utmost respect to the the mother of the king. You know, and if you do anything other than that, then you could suffer all kinds of consequences. But obviously, in the kingdom of heaven, we're not suffering necessarily consequences if you don't understand. Mary's role, if, you, if it's hard for a person to have a, a devotion to her, um, you know, just go back to Matthew chapter 7, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. You know, these are the pearls that Christ talks about, you know, and they're not going to just be casted before anybody. Uh, the same with any scripture verse. You can't just read the Bible and unlock all of the wisdom yourself. The wisdom that comes from the scripture comes from God himself. Any illumination, any realizations that you have, any revel revelations, that's God speaking to you, but he's doing so through the scriptures. And this is how Marian uh, devotion starts as well. You're not going to see it on the surface. You can go say rosaries every day. That might not be enough. Really what you have to do is you have to ask. You have to ask Christ. You have to ask the Holy Spirit to sort of help you to understand these types of things um, to the point to where I'm, I'm almost like, you know, there's times where I don't even really want to talk about Marian devotions with people outside of the Catholic Church simply because it's, just, it's a, a point of controversy and it doesn't matter how much my heart is in it. 
until God illuminates them and, and sort of shows them the truth behind it, they're not going to see it. We don't have enough scripture verses to sort of, uh, you, you know, say one way or the other definitively how things are. Uh, but then there's, there's, you know, that can be said for a number of different things that modern Christians believe, you know, things like grace, things like the Trinity, uh, all of these things that are part, you know, just as much as part of the, Christ, uh, the Christian tradition as the scripture is, you know, something like the Trinity or something like original sin, you know, we don't have scripture verses that specifically lines those things out for us. Um, but through uh, the Holy Spirit, the working of the Holy Spirit, we we know these things. And then through traditions, through the writings of these great saints and mystics, you know, starting with uh, the apostles and Paul and then uh, Augustine later on, um, you know, all of these early church fathers and writers and scholars were pretty much unanimous on, you know, these types of things. But the, the, the idea and the goal was to be sort of how Joseph was, a background character, you know, and then Mary is a little bit more pronounced in her role than Joseph was. But then again, if Mary was truly the humble and God-loving young lady that she was, then she would have assumed a background role as well because that would have been the humble thing to do. She would have probably been telling anybody interviewing her perhaps to write the scriptures. No, don't write too much about me. Just put this here. Just put this. Here. She probably wouldn't have wanted a lot of uh, discussion around her. Um, but, you know, this was part of God's plan all along. And now we see her sort of coming into the fold in modern in the modern era, you know, uh, in our, in, uh, with Our Lady of Guadalupe, one of my favorites there. Uh, but that again, it, it comes down to faith. Yeah, that that's wonderful, beautiful, beautiful, and and that's I think we should take with that during this Christmas uh, time. You know, we're gonna celebrate the birth of our Lord. We're gonna celebrate the the love and God breaking into time, coming uh, the hypostatic union, um, and Mary, the the just the love she had, the care. The care she had for Jesus, the baby, the 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 God child, all this stuff is so beautiful. So I think we need to hold that all in our minds as as we continue uh, this this Advent and this Christmas season. So let's get into what the main reason why you're here is uh, the mysticist tradition. Uh, why don't you kind of tell us a little bit about that and then also go into like what you're currently reading because I, I see you brought your books. And so uh, then you can go into like what you're reading and what you're taking out of it or what's what's making you ponder or think about stuff. It's like, well, you know, I mean, we've we've already discussed some of the mystical tradition in, in Catholicism uh, already during this talk uh, because of the uh, angel Gabriel appearing to Mary. I mean, that was a mystical experience that Mary had. And then not long after that, Joseph has another mystical experience with an angel. I don't know if they specifically say it's Gabriel. I think tradition says it's Gabriel. Uh, and he's told, you know, you know, you can take Mary as your wife. It's okay. And he's basically, he's let in on the secret. And then later on down the road, he gets another dream and he's told to fled to Egypt. And so these are all examples of mystical, you know, experiences that people have. You know, Moses having sort of one of the quintessential mystical experiences. And he has several of them. Uh, of course, for the first one with the burning bush. Uh, another big one would be the Ten Commandments. And so what is, is this is basically, you know, when the soul becomes in communion with God. You know, when, when you are sort of having some sort of experience of union with God, union with the Trinity, union with the Holy Spirit. Uh and that's when, you know, people are supposedly getting revelations, um, any kind of illumination. People have their aha moments. Uh, some people, it, it can be different, though. You know, there's different levels of mysticism. You know, one of the most profound ones is the book of Revelations. You know, uh, a very... John, yeah, that highly, highly misunderstood book, too. A highly, like... Uh, yeah, it could be very tricky to handle those waters, and that's why we need like uh, uh, interpretation from authority because it could get very. So yeah, definitely uh, the Gospel of John. I can definitely see that. Um, John the Baptist's mystical experiences involved him 
living a, a very humble life out in the desert and quote unquote preparing the way for the Lord, um, who was another great mystic. I think even Scripture says there's no greater man than he aside from Christ. So, uh, if you want to achieve, that's crazy because then because yeah, that's a, and then he was like this top guy, but then he even says and he goes, uh, you know, he uh, what I must decrease he must mm-hmm. increase that he's i'm not worthy to strap his so that just shows you how much if he's already hailed john the baptist hailed at his great you know and then jesus comes he's like i'm not even close yeah. kind of like what we're talking about we're like oh it's all straw thomas aquinas's word and we talked about like mm-hmm. it's not even like scratch the surface that's amazing right and then even going to john of the baptist's birth you know his uh his own conception and then his father's mystical experience zechariah while in prayer, uh, doing an incense offering or whatever, saying prayers, and then he's visited by an angel. He doesn't being being what I would imagine is a, is a pious person who discerns and wonders if this is an, actually an angel. He questions it, but then because he questions it, he gets his mouth he gets yeah. silenced. So, kind of a funny story. But then you know th- that gives a, an opportunity for Elizabeth to sort of be the voice of the family yeah. and, and be the one that declares the name of John the Baptist. And the, because his father's you know, mouth, like sewn, Zachariah sewn shut, which is as a podcaster is uh, one of my worst nightmares ever to have my mouth shut. So I could definitely like see that the fearful of that. So it's and it's kind of if you look at it, I'm just thinking of that now. You know, you had Adam and Eve, right, and then you have sort of Eve that sort of almost takes the fall for all of humanity, which they sort of both take responsibility for that. You know, where was Adam sort of protecting Eve when that happened? But then you have the the patriarchs that come after that, right? And it's like the male figure is, is the leader. It's the male figure is the voice. But then the New Testament, when Christ comes, the gospel, it's, there, it's flipped. You know, God... Uh, you know, alludes to that in Genesis when he says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. Yeah. But yeah, giving the voice to Elizabeth, giving the, the opportunity to, uh, you know, carry the, the son of God in her womb. You know, he, he redeems humanity through the women. And so it's no longer uh, the business of, you know, saying, well, it was Eve's fault. You know, it was never really was, but it was the woman that you put me here. And he blames, like not only blames Eve, he goes, it was the woman. And he blames God that you, you put her here with me. So yeah, I imagine a very emotional scene. Yeah. Where Adam is distraught yes. and he's weeping and he's, he's completely broken. Yes. And, and like any other person, it doesn't, has trouble taking responsibility yeah. for his actions. Like we all, kind of experience and i think the myth like the the spiritual exercises the uh the self-surrendering the contemplation the prayer uh that that combines that that is the mystical tradition i think all of those being close with the divine you know through those exercises i think that could as you see in scriptures like you pointed out and then as you see in in you know we'll, we'll get into later a little bit the modern and you see that combining and through all that uh, contemplation, contemplation, men- mental prayer, all these different things. It's just, just having God's grace, you know, having God's grace, his, his, his holy presence upon you, just over you. And I, I think that could really help. Yeah. And one of the things that is important to say with regard to mysticism, you know, like there, are, this is a universal thing. This is a worldly uh, acknowledgement is not just Christianity or Judaism that acknowledges mysticism, which is sort of a deeper religious experience. This is the kind of stuff that Harlan a- atheists or, you know, devout scientists, I suppose, th- that are adamantly against a, a, a divine figure or a creator, they won't even acknowledge the mystical aspect or the experience of religion or the experience of the presence of God. And so it doesn't matter where you go in the world. Most religions are going to have an element of mysticism yeah. or religious experience that they're going to talk about. Uh, but I think it's important for anybody, especially novices, you know, myself, or you know, anybody that's interested in the mystical or interested in encountering God, is to know that we are not the ones that can do that. And so... Does it help to practice breathing? Yes. Does it help to say prayers? Yes. Does it help to fast? 
Yes, does it help to burn incense or, you know, all of these things do help, but one shouldn't do these things for the purpose of getting, having a mystical experience. One should do that for the love of God and so that they can receive grace from God. And then through that process, then maybe a person might have some kind of mystical experience and it's going to be unique. It's going to be different. You know, every person is going to have their own sort of uh, experience with that. Um, but uh, don't pursue mysticism for the sake of mysticism and don't fool yourself into thinking. And this is what uh, people outside of Catholicism might do is uh, maybe in different traditions, they might focus and they might do all of their prayer and devotion for the purpose of connecting with God on a spiritual or some sort of transcendent level. Uh, and that's kind of not the way to go about it. You know, the way to go about it is, is that, you know, if God so chooses to give me any type of grace or illumination, that's what he's going to do. And all I'm going to do is basically just be open to his will, you know, and that's where it really starts. It's just sort of humble approach to I know nothing. God knows everything. Uh, if he chooses to give me something, he will. If not, I'm still going to love him and approach him in this pious and reverent way, regardless of what happens. You know, because Mother Teresa, for instance, uh, she didn't really receive very many spiritual consolations. She had a yeah. very mystical experience early on in her life, which led her into uh, devout, you know, work in in the slums of India. But then as her life progressed... Yeah, just read some of the writings, yeah. She, she didn't experience any kind of mystical, you know, and that... Desolations and yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, she, basically God's presence sort of recedes mm -hmm. and she's not necessarily feeling it. I'm sure mm -hmm. she was probably experiencing it through the work that she was doing. Sure. But it was a very real yeah. spiritual, mystical experience that she had and then she didn't get those again. Yeah, to be united with the divine... And the purpose of life to have to love selflessly, to love, absolutely love selflessly, give yourself up. That is the meaning of life. And to, of course, to be united to God. And uh, we see it in the saints. Um, uh, different past saints are all different. They have different personalities and all that. But uh, I think that is the ultimate purpose of, of a mystic's life is that selfless love of the entire your whole reason to live in union with the the, the divine in that mystic uh, tradition so what are some of the maybe the kind of current contemporary mystics um since we kind of you know talked about like in the bible and and all that but like what what are some now because i see some books that you're reading so can you talk us uh through like one of the books that you're currently reading and what you're getting out of it um and what surprised you about anything in there that you've been reading? Sure. Um, so, well, my first kind of uh, experience learning about or reading about, you know, Catholic mysticism in particular. I mean, I'd kind of heard about that growing up as a kid. I was raised Catholic, and uh, you hear about, uh, you know, St. Faustina, for instance, going into like these states of ecstasy, they call it, where they receive illumination, they receive visions and things like that. And so you look at Catholic mysticism as a regular Joe Schmo laity person as uh, something that only a saint is going to experience, you know. Uh, and more than likely, those those deep ecstasies where they're receiving, you know, very profound visions or maybe they're seeing actual apparitions uh yeah more than likely that's that's only going to be for a select amount of you know few very special people um but uh that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen and, and i think that it has been happening i think there have been a lot of people that have had some sort of experience where they've maybe felt the presence of the holy spirit and uh those are uh, you know mystical experiences in and of themselves I believe that's. I believe it might be more common than people realize. Mm -hmm. Really, truly. Yeah, it it definitely is, and uh, there's probably far more mystics out of there in the world right now that we don't know about, and that's because they're being humble. You know, they're they're realizing that anything that they think they know, maybe they don't actually know, and it's, who who are they to share it? And so, uh, even somebody like Faustina, like 
you know, they're going to discern and question whether or not they should even tell anybody about the experiences that they have at first because they're they're not really sure where it came from at first. Just like Mary, she's sitting there in front of the angel and she questions the angel, you know, like and she ponders in her head, like, how, what could this be? Like, you know, how can this be? Uh, and that's the perfect approach to any kind of experience that a person has, you know, uh, is where is this coming from? We've always got to be sort of discerning where, where things are coming from. Uh, and so, the first sort of uh, real reading that I did on it was John of the Cross, just, you know, random, you know, excerpts and stuff like that. And just sort of kind of reading a little bit more about his life. Uh, it popped up at a point in time in my life where I was kind of going through rapid spiritual growth um, and then finding out a little bit more about, you know, how he came about, where he based his, his you know, thought processes and his writings off of. Uh, the comparisons of that, you know, to other faiths. For instance, I think John of the Cross was accused of being a Buddhist at some point in time in his life. And so, and imagine like the time too, like in the 16th century, because mm-hmm. uh, also St. Teresa Avila was around that time of John of the Cross. So like, wow, yeah. like imagine that time period when uh, they were around the same time, St. Teresa Avila and John of the Cross, 16th century. What an amazing, I mean, yeah. and you have the other mystics, of course, but. And she um, was his, she, Teresa yeah. of Avila was his mentor, mm-hmm. was, was John of the Cross's mentor. So yeah, uh, there was definitely some things going on. Uh, I've started reading her one of her books called the the Interior Castle. Castle, and it's funny at the beginning of it she really goes overboard emphasizing this is only for cloistered nuns. I can't imagine why anybody outside of a convent would ever want to read any of these writings. Yeah. It would be just silly. She basically just says it would be absolutely silly for anybody outside of the convent to read these things, and so uh, you won't really hear a lot about mysticism, the church doesn't really like to teach these types of things because uh, it's, it's not just, it's, it's not uh, novice level, you know, uh, Christianity. Outside of Catholicism, different Christians might even just say that's all evil or, you know, like we shouldn't even be talking about that at all. Do you think that's like, um, is, do you think that might be a reason why like now, like even more like very contemporary, contemporary, there's, it seems like there was more back then, like Padre Pio or St. Faustina. Um, it feels like there was a lot more back then. Do you think that contributes to anything or it's just more people learn the lessons of the past and kind of like, hey, I'm going to be more, uh, either, even more humble or even more, I'm not going to talk about it. I, I think that there's probably always been a lot of mystics. We probably just, we've only ever heard about a, a select few of them. And this could be said for, you know, in the Christian tradition, the Catholic tradition, there's probably a lot more people out there. But that's the thing. Like, if you're living the way that the gospel, that Christ taught you to live, then you're a background character in life. Yeah. You know, you're not supposed to be at the front. And a lot of these saints really didn't get put out into the forefront until maybe after their life. You know? So you're, wait, so, so you be in the background and just not even, you know, doing, so you're saying I'm not supposed to have a plane. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> right, right. Wait a minute. But, yeah. but, but I see a lot of uh, preachers, they're like, I need, the Lord wants me to have first class G5 plane. So no, so I'm not supposed to have a big mansion. Right. I'm not supposed to have a plane. No G6. Oh man, come on, know? man. Come on. That's no uh, fun. <laughs> I'm just right. playing. Just kidding. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, completely, uh, you know, that's not it. Like, uh, somebody that's really having true mystical experiences isn't going to be going around telling everybody, God told me to say this, God told me to say that. You know, watch out and for, for those folks. And for three payments of fifty nine ninety nine, you can get these gifts too, you know, stuff like that, infomercial type of preaching. Uh, that, that Actually, that makes more sense. That makes more sense that we only, like, again, in recent, the last 100 or 200 years, just uh, St. Faustina and Padre Pio and a few others, um, that, that that makes more sense that I can see that. Uh, but I will say that we do, I like that we at least know about some of them because I think their writings, like, um, their writings are important. And, yeah, I, I, I would, with all due respect, I would say she was wrong. Like, who would want to read this? No, we would want to, the lady would want to read this because I think there's a lot of interior castles. I think it's, it's brought a lot of fruit. So 
um, I'm glad that at least some of them, by God's uh, will, that we have their writings uh, because it could help us out. You know, Francis de Sales and any of these these introductions to the devout life, these contemplative contemplatives. I think we need more of that in this modern technical world that we're living in with iPhones and, and the phones and the, the the Netflixes and the streaming and the bingings. We need silence. We need that contemplative imagination uh, that we're missing and we don't get that. So these writings, I think, uh, more so than ever now, the the mystic tradition, uh, I think, could come um, and be a big factor in in this century that we're living in, of being plugged in to screens, right. and going out in the in the, the the corner of your home or in nature outside or in in the church in a chapel and and just praying and just staying in silence meditating like you said the rosary or even meditating on, on some of the works of john of the cross mm-hmm. you know reading some of padre pio's uh, the interior castle like any of these great works francis de sales just just kind of like doing their meditations yeah. reading their passages a chapter or a few and of course scripture and i think that's needed um now more than ever to break the spell of the this auto kind of uh, consumerism of this technology consumerism uh, in big tech in the world. So what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the way I look at it is, you know, you have the, the we'll take Teresa of Avila's interior castle, for instance. She discusses, I think, different chambers of the yeah. soul or different levels of prayer that are associated with that. And having some structure, I think, for certain people, because some people need structure in order to accomplish or in order to stay on, on a task. So, uh contemplating you know deeper elements of the faith that you cannot get on the surface level that you won't hear from a preacher uh that you won't even read in scripture you know like sometimes you just got to be able to set aside some time and just devote yourself to something you know and so reading something reading a writing of somebody that uh clearly had a close relationship with god or maybe even a mystical relationship with god can be somewhat illuminating uh, to other people, you know, I know there's several of, you know, uh, like Bishop Barron, for instance, you know, he'll make references to Augustine's confessions and there really aren't very many elements of mysticism in that book, for instance, but you can definitely tell that there was illumination during the process, you know, and his dialogues that he's having with himself in some ways are probably dialogues, uh, between him and the Holy Spirit at some point in time. Same thing with, with Aquinas, who will quote Augustine. And so, uh, but there is a huge, rich tradition of wonderful writings. Uh, and any good Christian is always going to discern everything that they read. And so you can approach traditional reading or writings with an open mind and an open heart, but you don't have to marry yourself to it like you do the Scripture. You know, when you read Scripture, we have to approach it as if it's the infallible Word of God. This is the Word of God, and so this is something that I have to trust. I have to put full trust and faith in this. Reading something like uh, John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul, well, you know, I can read that a little bit more loosely. You know, uh, I can approach that a little bit differently than I would Scripture, you know. I think something, since you mentioned St. John of the Cross— um, one of the quotes he has is, seek by reading and you will find by meditating. Cry in prayer and the door will be open in contemplation. Speaking of crying, that was right on cue. Um, St. John of the Cross. I yeah. mean, I think that's uh, St. Teresa Avila. He's, he's describing important... Lectio Divina. Yeah, you know, yeah. Where you, you know... You, Everybody should do that every day. Read a, yes. read read one line from Scripture and sit for fifteen minutes and just ask, you know, ask for God to to show you something, you know, and He will. That's that's how the Scripture works. It's it's, uh, it's and, a yeah. supernatural thing. And Lexio Divina is beautiful, and, and meditating on the Scripture and too, and even or even that quote from Saint John of the Cross or any of the mystics. Um, do your Lexio Divina, and then also you can incorporate some of the stuff like this. Like I like the one Saint Teresa Avila. She says the important thing is is not to think too much, but to love much. Do then whatever most arouses you to love. And I mean, just 
meditating on that, doing a, a kind of, you know, kind of like a Lexio on that. Um, there's so many traditions, the, the dark, you mentioned the dark night of the soul, um, things like that, the interior castle. I think it helps people, uh, when you hear in, in the, in the interior castle about how you're going to move up, you're going to progress in chambers. And, and, but then you, you, you might go back, you might take a step back. You might take two steps back you might go up and that kind of gives you a sense of peace, you know, instead of dissolution, like, oh man, um, I'm not even like, um, St. Uh, Mother Teresa was like, yeah, man, right now I feel God is not, I don't feel as present as much, but of course he's always there. But you know, in, in that way of like the mystical experience she had and you, you can tell, you know, when you're in it, you're like, yes, God is his grace. I can feel his hand upon me. And then there's times when it, if his hand may feel like it's, it's further away, like he draws away. And so reading, um, interior castles or something like St. John of the cross, dark night of the soul, that is in a way comforting and I know some, some non-Catholics might be like, oh, you Catholics, you guys are so dark. You're so melancholic. And you guys are... But that helps, though, because think about this. If if uh, children in, in the Middle East and in Africa, everything can't be like, your life's going to be perfect and just pray to Jesus. And, and the, the prosperity gospel, which I reject, wholeheartedly reject. I think it's very... It's not good at all. Because as soon as bad things happen, and they will, and as soon as uh, tough things happen, sufferings, and they will that's going to crumble unless you're literally like super, super, super rich. You're born with a good personality and you're just always a naturally happy guy and you're famous and, and, and money for a certain extent, you can live comfortably in your cage until the cage shuts open and or shuts closed and then you can't get out. Um, so that's why I think, um, uh, Augustine, you know, the confessions, yes. And of course, he, he, City of God, he's written, but I would say more so confessions. Uh, I, I would say um, that uh, would be very good to go by and, and do like a, just a little meditating on, on the confessions of, of St. Augustine. Um, but what do you think about also, um, like, because I know you, I, I see on your arm, and we talked about too, you have the little chalky on there. And you were saying you got like a, like a good one. Too. I can see it's nice and sturdy. The Jesus prayer, like amazing that the Jesus prayer, doing the Jesus prayer. If I go to adoration, um, I, I usually, usually start off with the Jesus prayer and just kind of like wash everything out, flush out mind, body and soul and just flush it out. So God can dwell inside those. Um, and I usually start off, uh, with the Jesus prayer. And so, so how do you do that? Do you incorporate the Jesus prayer a lot or I try to do like, you know, 15 to 30 minutes of the Jesus prayer at some point in time during the day. Uh, and and how- if people too, also people, if people don't know what the Jesus prayer is, um, I do it with breathing. You do it, you know, breathe in, hold it for two seconds or so. And I, that's the way I do it. You know, I breathe in, hold it for one or two, and then I breathe out like Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I just, you just repeat. And I do it with my breath, and 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 it really helps. And of course, there's psychological uh, psychology behind that too, because you know when when you have anxiety or stress, it, breathe, breathe, breathe. And God knows what He's doing. God, we're, it's just science is just catching up. And like, hey, uh, what do you know? Science is is showing this in psychology. Oh, that was always here, just like mathematics was always here, even before we discovered the Pythagorean theorem or two plus two equals four. Two plus two equals uh two plus two equals equaled four even when the dinosaurs were here um who put those here oh, obviously god but we're discovering them so to, to me psychology when they're when they get it right because they don't always but when they get it right uh like like that's a new thing now right like in a way do you feel like mysticism is like the secular version is starting to be prevalent, which is, is good in a way, but also bad because they're kind of pretty much still just like just uh, yoga and uh, uh, do uh, centering, you know, a lot of uh, what mindfulness. And that's, there's a bunch of meditative apps. That's sure. why hallowed. We there's all different hallowed. kinds of it. And this is ancient. What, what this it's, is, is, it's is, not new. Yeah. yeah. This is, uh, you know, the, the, like the Jesus prayer, you know, what's the the big thing? What's the key to that? What what's the secret? Why is that? Why is that so powerful? The thing was well, because you're focusing on Christ, you're focusing on the cross, which is really the pinnacle of Christian mysticism. 
You know, it's Jesus on the cross. It's Jesus' death on the cross. Yeah. And his name, just the, the name, there's power in the name of Jesus. Right. Hey, somebody should make a song that, that the chorus goes, there's power in the name of Jesus. I'm, there's yeah, probably that, something out there. <laughs> no, there is. There is. There, there's a radio song like that. So I can't steal it. But yeah, um, there is power. And just saying, there was what was it? Uh, there's this book um, called, I'm, I'm, the author's escaping me right now, but it's called um, Hostile Witness. Hostile witnesses, and in one of them, and, and this is like it goes back. I don't remember during the Roman times, I believe, maybe the second, third century. Um, they would even um, there's there's writings from oppositions of Christianity talking about how the name of Jesus would heal people, and these these aren't Christians writing this. These are the Romans, the opposition, saying, "Yeah, uh, we have to ban this name because they're 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 healing and they're doing stuff." Well, again, to them, they're looking at it as a magic, but it's not. But they're looking at it like the name of Jesus. Just his name has power. Mm-hmm. So, and to me, that that to find writings from the first or second century from hostile witnesses. Hostile witnesses are people that that are not you. You know, your so your so called enemies. Mm-hmm. So when they start attesting in a way, they're kind of witnessing in a way. That's why it's also witnesses. So I remember reading about that is that the name Jesus that has power in it. Mm-hmm. Um what was it a few years ago where it was it was a little controversy. I don't think it was that much, but it was kind of interesting. Uh that like something about like uh Alexa or one of the robotic things, they wouldn't even say the word Jesus or something like that, but I think they got taken care of. But to me it shows again the power in uh Jesus. Sure, yeah. I mean that that's where the power is. You know, the Jesus prayer was something that I didn't really know growing up. Uh that's definitely more and more prominent in the Eastern traditions. Um but I but I enjoy it. And then there's a there's a book that I think it's called The Way of the Pilgrim where it specifically talks about that, uh, you know, and, you know, it's, you know, the Jesus prayer, prayer almost can help you get to that uh, prayer of silence where you're in a basically a perpetual contemplative state, contemplative state, uh, you know, where you're breathing, you're breathing in the name of Jesus Christ and then you're exhaling mercy, you're exhaling your sins. Usually it's not that known or I come across Catholics that may not be too familiar with the Jesus prayer, like you're saying, or even the chalky, but it's it's pretty much just rope knots, right? And rope knots and you just pray and you could kind of count like a rosary beads, uh, but it's just all one, you know, has a little, yours has a little cross at the end and it's just, it's just a prayer rope that you can go in. And of course we see similar things in other religions has incorporated, you know, the Buddhists and all this stuff, but it, it's, a, it's a Catholic thing, you know, um, yeah, a lot of the Eastern Catholics, most of uh, Eastern Catholicism knows like, um, have that also the rosary too, but I think in the West, um, we're starting to like incorporate this and we're saying, Hey, this is a beautiful, beautiful tradition. It's an early church tradition, similar to uh, a rosary. So just, just in case anybody was like, what are they talking about? Chot key. Yeah. Chot. And I'm saying, I don't say a chot key. Yeah. So that, that's what it is. Just a prayer rope beads and, and you just use it to count, you know, the name of Jesus over and over and over. Mm-hmm. So that, that's what it is in case anyone's wondering. Yeah. And you know, like it, it, what happens during this process is, is you may be saying prayers repetitiously, uh, but then you know something starts to happen there with the mind and with the soul, with the faculties of the soul. You know that goes beyond the sensories, that goes beyond the faculties of the body, and so focusing on the, the beads can sort of be an anchor that help you lead, that help lead you that way, or focusing on the repetitious prayer where you can sort of sink deeper into a different state, and so. These are things that we can do on our end in, in the world to sort of help us, uh, you know, reach that state. But at the end of the day, union with God only happens when he's ready for it. So uh, some people may, you know, repeat the Jesus prayer and never really get anything from it. And that's just how it will go for them. Other folks may have an experience from them. Uh, I can say for sure that, you know, focusing on your breathing is a really important aspect to prayer, especially if you're just going to pray in silence and maybe just sit in silence. And I've got a book here. This is a prayer book from the Missionaries of Charity. That's Mother Teresa's order. And she says here in her six points to help you in your meditation, you know, the first one is reading the scripture. Uh, and then because the word of God rests in the subconscious mind and conditions you for a personal meeting with Jesus the next morning. So she suggests reading scripture the night before and then the morning, right when you wake up first thing. The second part, she says to feel, you know, settle down, feel relaxed. 
But uh, if you find it hard uh, to concentrate, concentrate on your breathing. You'll find it a good means uh, of relaxing. So she's saying that, uh, you know, basically scripture is where you start with your meditation. And then if you if you have trouble, you need to relax, focus on your breathing. Uh, you know, so just focus on your breath. You don't even have to focus while praying. Just focus on your breathing. If you want to take deeper breaths, that's fine, too. If you want to take shallow breaths. But uh, that's not just a Catholic thing. That is a universally recognized thing. And I suggest that to anybody, even if you're not religious, uh, just Focus on your breathing throughout the day, uh, especially in times of anxiety or in times of stress. Focus on the breath. And if you, have, if, you, if you follow Christ and, you know, Jesus is Lord for you, then focus on the Jesus prayer. And you might see some really significant effects that can happen from that, focusing on your breath and focusing on Christ uh, and focusing on the, the Holy Spirit. I mean, matter of fact, uh, the Greeks, you know... Um, the word pneuma, you know, we, we know pneuma from pneumonia, you know, uh, this is the breath. They viewed the spirit and the soul as basically the same thing as the breath, you know. And uh, it's sort of a lost art, you know. I wasn't taught to focus on my breathing uh, growing up when I prayed, but now it's like I, I recognize that I don't have to do that, but it certainly helps out immensely if I remember to focus on my breathing during prayer. Centering yourself, leaving yourself open to have God's graces, to have those blessings. Um, I see that your your this book that you have. So, um, yeah, so what, what is that? One, uh, so this was a gift. This was a random gift from some from a lady, uh, and it was coming to me at a time when I needed to to read it, and it's just called the Inner Eye of Love mysticism and religion it's written by a guy named william johnston i believe he's a jesuit they've done a lot of work in other parts of the world where there's different religions and so uh you know they get a chance to see some of these other spiritual and religious practices up close and personal and so in this book he kind of will talk a lot about catholic or christian mysticism john of the cross comes up a lot um uh, a scholar, philosopher, mystic Dionysius comes up as well uh, in this book. Catholic mysti- mystical tradition mostly stems from Dionysius, who was a 5th and 6th century uh, mystic, basically. Thomas Aquinas quotes him 1,700 times uh, throughout his writings. Just a little excerpt here. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk of the gospel, but he says, you know, keeping in mind certain concepts of meditation, uh, and then what he said, uh, an importance to faith and love. These two things are important with regard to mysticism as well, faith and love. And for St. Paul, it was faith and love, and it was a focus on the cross. Um, but the Buddhist training, you know, Buddhism, this is what they, how they approach meditation, control of the mind, control of the breathing, and then control of the body. Uh, these three approaches converge to the desired goal of heightened awareness and even under certain circumstances at enlightenment. So you're, you're in a sense, you're emptying your body out. You're emptying your mind out from the world, you know, and sort of in a sense, you're detaching yourself from the world when you go into these deeper states of prayer and meditation. And what that does is you're basically making room and you're making space for the Holy Spirit. Because you're centering your mind and your heart and your soul on God, you know, and that's what it's all about. When you make your prayer and meditation about that, you know, that's the right angle. Uh, But Buddhism doesn't necessarily focus on that. I only think Buddhism doesn't really even identify a, a God or a creator necessarily. Their purpose of meditation is to sort of clear the mind and clear the soul. But whereas, you know, the Christian mystical tradition would be the detachment, the clearing yeah. of the mind and soul, empty, but like so you're that saying, you can yeah. accept, you know, the love of God in, you know, so that you're ready for that, so that you're yeah. a vessel for that. Because you have to empty, like like you were saying, empty yourself out. And this is uh, from Dark Night of the Soul. Saint John of the Cross says, uh, "Now that I no longer desire all, I have it all without desire." 
And that's when that detachment, that radical asceticism, that detachment from all things, the desire, those things, um, that's a beautiful thing. And again, I need to work on it too. I'm like, nah, I wish I could not desire this and not want that. And when you get into that mode and you feel that peace, it, it is peaceful. And it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't care if I get this. I don't care if I get that. I don't care. Right. You know, I, I, don't, I don't care if, if I get like a, a, you know, like a million uh, subscribers to my channel. No, I'm just saying, please uh, subscribe to I'm just saying, no. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? I don't care. If, yeah, but you're saying, I don't care if I get this. But that detachment. And I think these books could help. Um, I, I kind of wanted to talk also. What what is what 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 are your insights on on that book? What is uh, mystical? So this uh, is by the same author, okay, William the same Johnston, guy. and I got this book because uh, I really enjoyed the Inner Eye of Love by William Johnston. Who, okay. what his goal was is to sort of create a a mystical theology that sort of goes beyond just Catholicism. And that's the name of the book, right? Mystical theology. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's going to talk about Paul a good bit in there because Paul, of course, another mystic, another great Christian mystic who had visions and who had a, an encounter with Christ. In Damascus, and, yeah. Yeah, in I Damascus. mean, so he's big in there. He talks about uh, John of the Cross, of course. He talks about Dionysius. Now, there's Dionysius from Acts of the Apostles that is converted by Paul. And then there's Dionysius of like the 5th and 6th century who... I think for a while, the church, early church, mistook his writings for Dionysius of the Acts, you know, the first century Dionysius, who was a saint. Uh, it's, you know, they've since come to realize that that's not the same Dionysius, but they think that they that he took that name Dionysius uh, in homage to the original one. Uh, and his writings, of course, ended up being quoted yeah. and, and referred to by yeah. many, many writers. One of the one of the first uh, case mm -hmm. of identity theft, everybody right. in the, the, the fifth century. You know, it, it, somebody was I was watching some the other day. I think it, it could be similar to when uh, you know, like Pope Francis, for instance, takes the name Francis, you know, and, as an homage to Saint Francis, and in, in doing so, you sort of take on aspects of that or, or it's a centering or an anchoring of, of your mind and your heart to you know the works of that saint in particular so then you have the desert fathers um you know that he's that he's going to be referring to here and so the, i think this is more to do with like the eastern traditions um and you had some basically some monks who you know had some mystical experiences that they wrote about uh, Evagrius of Pontus, uh, you know, in the in the 300s, um, you know, these were Greeks, and they did some writing, and then they influenced some of the people. I think they might have influenced Benedict as well. Um, and then he's going to he talks about some about Thomas Merton, you know, in here as well. There are that's what William Johnston. So the mystical theology is his book, and that's kind of what one of his goals was was to create a mystical theology that sort of went beyond just Christian and Jewish uh, mystical traditions. Uh, because what he saw was uh, the similarities between, uh, especially Buddhism and Christianity. You know, the, the way that a Buddhist monk approaches prayer and meditation and the way that they approach life versus the way that a, a Catholic monk would approach all of those things, you know, and it's this, it's first, it's an acknowledgement of, you know, one's place, you know, where, where you're at, that the world is created, that we're all one, right? Then there's, you know, detachment from the things of the world, understanding that there's a soul there, there's something beyond what we see, uh, and that what we're really working towards is something beyond this world, right? And so an acknowledgement of that. And for Christians, the place to start is Christ. You know, for Catholics, the place to start is Christ. You know, uh, we can't grow in virtue without him. You know, you can do it the hard way, the way that the Buddhists do. And that's basically just complete deprivation of worldly things, deprivation of things like food. Deprivation of human contact, deprivation of relationships or marriage or having children, um, all of these things. But, um, you know, a lot of that stuff is fruitless if there's no, if God isn't at the heart of it. If God isn't at the center of it, if Christ isn't at the center of it, then it's, it's really just going to be fruitless, you know. 
Uh, so it, it would be sort of folly to focus on things like meditative breathing and mindfulness and uh, things of that nature if the purpose of it isn't to grow deeper in love with God. And I would say, too, about that, about you talking about the Zen and stuff, um, like even in Scripture, in the first Thessalonians, it says, uh, but test everything, hold fast to what is good. Mm-hmm. And even in Catholic theology, the wheel of truth, uh, Fulton Sheen talks about this, uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen, is like um, the Catholic Church acknowledges that in every religion there are elements. Some mm-hmm. are way farther from the truth. Some are a little close, but still far. And then some are closer to the truth of you know our Lord Jesus. You know that we would, as Catholics we would say the Catholic Church. But um, yeah, it's the will of truth that some truths are farther or closer. And every every single even back like bc whatever it is you know around where judaism and before judaism and other there are small elements of the truth of the divine because as human beings since the beginning of time we all looked up to the sky and we all had that innate sense that there is something above there's the transcendent and again uh the wheel in god's providence um slowly walking slowly revealing aspects of his divine mm-hmm. being himself with Jesus and then and later, later the church and, and all this stuff. Like there's overlaps in, in all these, you know, that we talked about there's overlapping and stuff. I think t- even Thomas Merton, he wrote a book. What was it on something, something, right? Wasn't it? He, he, he was the one that wrote something on Buddhism or something like that. Was mm-hmm. it Thomas Merton? Stuff? Yeah. I forget something like, like that. Yeah. Like and again, that. it's not like, of course we're not saying, yes, go do yoga and do the, the, the practice, the, uh, the actual meditation of yoga. No, don't, don't, don't meditate mm-hmm. on the actual thing. Cause that, you know, that's not God. That would right. don't worse. You're not supposed to do any of that. Like catechism is clear, but it also teaches, we get a knowledge there's truth and everything. So I think that's something to, mm-hmm. to keep uh, mind open and keep like, yeah. So the way um, I see it is, is this, is, and this is just kind of a theory, is it's like, well, you know, how can, uh, you know, somebody outside of, you know, Christianity, you know, somebody that doesn't acknowledge Christ receive any kind of legitimate illumination during meditation? Mm-hmm. And, and I think it just comes down to, well, God can illuminate or enlighten anybody that he wants. And he, what he, he appreciates reverence. We know this from reading the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. He appreciates people that are pious, that are reverent, that, you know, turn away from the things of the world and seek yep. wisdom, you know. And so, sure, there are plenty of people outside of the, the Christian and Catholic traditions that are seeking wisdom, you know. That's why the Greek philosophers lined up so perfectly. Yeah, Aristotle, yeah. With Christianity, it's well, philosophy, mm-hmm. the love of wisdom. Well, yeah. wisdom comes from God. So they were, in Definitely. a sense, indirectly very religious yes. people without even realizing it simply because they loved wisdom. So they loved God whether they knew it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Even St. Paul says, you guys worship the unknown God. Let me tell you who he is. Let me show you like, yes, there's element. And then he quotes Greek, Greek people and philosophers or whatever. But, um, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that, man. I'll tell you what though, this, this has been excellent. This has been illuminating. This has been fun. I enjoyed this. Um, Hoping to have you again on for more frequent uh, talk. Anything you can gather from any like last thought that you can leave us with uh, if we're interested or, or want to uh, practice more of the, the mystical side of the church? We should all become better at seeing God in the world, seeing God in the people that we meet, seeing God uh, in, in nature, in the environment around us, uh, and breathing you know, breathing God, like pneuma, like the Greeks talked about, uh, just the, the the prayer of silent where you're where you're focused on God's presence in and around you, working in all things at all times. That's really where the mystical path begins, is understanding that you're here for a very specific reason that has to do with God's love, God's love for you. Uh, and, you know, that every day is, is a testament to that. And every breath that you take, you know, is a testament to that. So start there. Start with just understanding that your breath, you're breathing in, you know, life. Uh, and then God is all around you. And Matthew chapter 7, you know, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be open to you. Start there, you know, start right there. Know that some people 
may seem like they know a little bit more, but nobody knows anything but by the grace of God. And so if you want to know more, just ask God for grace, you know, and he will surely give it to you. I can't promise he'll give it to you overnight, but he will at some point in time. Man, again, thank you for, for coming on the show. Thank you guys that are listening. If you guys could please, please, please do me a favor. Would you give me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps out, helps us get up in the ratings and helps us get up to reach more people. Would you guys please, please do that? Enjoyed this. Again, a Merry Christmas to everybody uh, as we celebrate this uh, Adventus Christus, the coming of our Lord, the arrival. Thank you guys for joining me. Also to the Blessed Virgin Mary, pray for us. Um, would you leave us with a close us out with the glory be glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without ending thank you thank you godspeed god bless everybody thank you thank you